Good afternoon, good evening, uh, everybody, wherever you are and at which time. Um, my name is Timo Dickscheid. I'm working in, in Jülich with Katrin Amons um, and in, the, um, in Germany also in the Human Brain Project, besides uh, working with these uh, nice people here in, in Highball and with the Big Brain. And what I would like to um, show you is how the big brain is integrated into e-brains, which is the uh, research infrastructure we are building in Europe in the Human Brain Project. And there, big brain is really an important cornerstone uh, in, in the atlases that we are hosting in e-brains and also for the infrastructure. And I like to give this a focus uh, today. So uh, the idea would be, I think I have roughly 45 minutes I give you a brief overview of, uh, of the Atlas services in the eBrains infrastructure, just to give you an orientation. Um, then I wanted to show you how you can explore the Atlases and eBrains uh, interactively in a web browser. Uh, but since uh, Nicola already um, showed you the big brain in all details and uh, several times also in this um, online viewer that we are building, I will be very short here. So we will do that very quickly. And uh, then the focus will be um, how to use big brain and the eBrains art classes in a programmatic fashion uh, with a new software library that is called Zebra Python, uh, where you can do many things with big brain. Um, and I would really like to go with you into the code and show you a few examples. So um, I think we can deal here with uh, with your feedback and questions as in other sessions, just post them into the chat. I, I hope Susanna or PJ pay a bit of attention if I don't uh, uh, recognize it and I can stop at any time. So th this uh, whole tutorial is not strictly prepared in a sense that I cannot stop. I, I can actually uh, go into details wherever you like. So just, uh, just ask if there's something. Um, eBrains Atlas services. So in eBrains, we are building atlases, uh, developing atlases of, of different species and what you can access uh, currently, uh, also in this online viewer that Nicola has shown, but also through other tools, uh, is an atlas of the human brain, an atlas of the red brain, um, and the Ellen Mouse brain atlas. There is another atlas in development, which will have a first release uh, rather soon, towards the end of the year. Uh, an atlas of the monkey brain, but this is not yet uh, yet available. I just wanted to mention it already. And eBrains um, is a, um, a rather broad infrastructure, which also deals with compute resources, uh, uh, data sharing, collaborative tools, uh, uh, neural robotics, neuromorphic hardware, things like this, but also atlases, and that's where eBrains comes in. So there is this portal page eprints.eu, which, which looks like here on my screen. Um, and there is a range of services offered. And you see here brain simulation, brain inspired technologies, and atlases. Um, and the part um, of atlases is roughly structured into three different aspects of, of tools or services. Uh, one of them are software interfaces to work with atlases right away in blue, and this is what I will talk about today mostly. Uh, then there are tools and workflows for integrating data to atlases. Um, and uh, there are tools and workflows for analyzing data um, with the help of brain atlases. We will touch this briefly today, uh, but that's not the focus. The focus is the software interfaces for working with atlases, and they're in the big brain model. Um, the way that eBrains is designed uh, in, uh, in the context of atlases um, is as follows. Um, so we work very closely with what we call the eBrains curation services. Um, these are actually real people who help curating data sets, um, structuring the metadata and bringing them into the eBrains knowledge graph, which is a graph database uh, for, for structured search and access to metadata. And uh, we are using this pipeline actually to feed in the atlases as well. So the atlas that we are building are actually composed of curated data sets that are interlinked with each other and where most of the information is stored in this events knowledge graph. 
From there, we have then these different Atlas services that access this information, this metadata and data sets uh, stored in the background uh, to actually uh, allow to work with atlases to see the data to see this information and uh, very often this is this large arrow here is invisible so you're not you're not really seeing that this happens in the background although uh, the system provides you with links uh, so that you can always uh, for most of the entities see the underlying data sets with the metadata and then the other services are also using infrastructure, high performance computing infrastructure in Europe, which is uh, actually the backbone of, uh, of eBrains and which gives us storage resources and compute resources. And this, of course, has a lot in common with uh, what you have seen in, uh, in the previous um, tutorial today. A point that I'd like to make here is um, that we believe that atlases are important for reproducible neuroscience and we want to structure the atlases in eprints in a way that they lend themselves nicely for reproducible science and here are three aspects of this the first aspect is um, we design them as uh, as fair data sets i already talked about this so everything that we have in the atlases is typically a curated data set in eprints um, and you can see this when when you go into this viewer we will do that in a minute again uh, you, you have find uh, a lot of buttons to actually see descriptions, uh, information that comes from the knowledge graph that is really attached to the data sets. Um, the second aspect is that we want these interfaces uh, to the atlases to allow for reproducible workflows. And uh, one important aspect of this is that we provide both an interactive access so that you can click and, and visually explore everything, but also an access uh, via Python and other APIs that you can uh, connect to programmatic workflows and uh, rerun as, as you like. Um, so in one, and one aspect of this is the, the Zebra tool suite that we are developing with Zebra Explorer, which is this interactive viewer that you have already uh, seen in Nicolas' talk and that will, I will show you very briefly. And Zebra Python, which gives you access to uh, even more functionalities uh, in, in Python, but under the hood is doing the exact same things. Um, and then there's a third aspect that I'd like to highlight that Atlas make help to make new science data better findable and interpretable uh, because they add location metadata to your data sets and uh, and they and also atlases provide you ways of finding data by their location and related to locations and here's a very simple example so if, if you have would have such a such a volume of interest from an histological experiment uh, if it's uh, if you if you get it um, um, separate without any further information of course it's it's rather difficult to interpret although many of you would know what we see here uh, but if you even if you do a rough um, a rough link of such a data set with an atlas so here's a here's just a quick preview of how, how that could be positioned in the big brain space you can get a lot more meaning out of this so from this image here on the right you know immediately which hemisphere it is at least if you would zoom out a little bit and you you have an idea of the orientation you have an idea of the distance to other structures and so on so there's a lot uh, of additional information that you get by linking data sets to brain atlases. Um, <clears throat> the eBrain's human brain atlas uses the big brain model, which is here illustrated on the left side, um, and links it to the MNI space and also to the free surface surface space in, in two ways by using spatial transformations um, so that, that you, you have a knowledge about corresponding coordinates in these spaces but also by using corresponding regions. Yeah, we have many cytoarchitectonic regions mapped in the big brain now, and this uh, number of mapped regions is growing uh, continuously. And of course, we have many more of these regions mapped in the MNI space, even uh, as you see here on, on the right uh, with probabilistic maps, uh, where you have, um, uh, where we can capture the variability across different postmodern brains where these areas have been mapped. Um, and then we have, of course, by, by mapping them in the big brain and having these, these maps in the MNI space, we have a direct link because these maps have been performed according to the uh, very same principles. 
So Bitbrain here plays an important role because it gives us the link from these parcellations and then eye space to the microscopic world where we have more detail um, in, 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 in terms of higher resolutions. And then we, uh, we try to link as many as possible data sets to brain regions in eBrains with the help of, of these curation teams that I mentioned, so that for brain regions, you can actually access different data sets that give you a, a multimodal description of these brain regions. So there is data from histology, uh, connectivity data, different uh, data sets linked to brain regions. And these can be accessed in this online viewer. Here's a small movie, but uh, you can also check this out live in a minute. So that's the basic idea. But in this tutorial, I wanted to go into the concrete tools with you and have a look at a few things, get our hands on it. So um, let's do that. I hope I can switch here the screen. Um, I see here something interesting. So here we are in the online viewer, and uh, you have you have seen the viewer um, in the presentation of Nicola a lot, I think. So here's here's the big brain, and you can uh, you can access this viewer uh, via the eBrains page. But there's also a shortcut. Um, I will I will paste it in the link. If you want to reach big brain right away, you can simply type bigbrain.brainatlas.eu, um, and you should you should be there seeing uh, roughly the same thing that I'm seeing and. Uh, um, I would also encourage you to just uh, do that in your browser, so you can try out a few things in parallel. So uh, in this in this application here, you can select different atlases. We are currently concerned with the human atlas, and we have currently on display this uh, beautiful cortical layer maps from Konrad Wachstuhl here. Uh, the different where you can see the different layers. Uh, Nicola has mentioned this, so I can also select a different layer here and look at this. You can zoom in with the scroll wheel of the mouse um, and have a bit Q. Uh, um, you, can, uh, you can temporarily disable the maps that are shown. And as you see here, for example, I have, I'm zooming in uh, quite a lot here uh, into, the, into the big brain to the 20 micron resolution. You can see that there are um, larger cells can be individually distinguished but of course, you cannot see all the smaller cells at a resolution of 20 micrometer. You would need to be, go a bit deeper. And we are here in the Highball project um, working hard to give you soon access to even higher resolutions of the data. But this is freely accessible. And you see after a little while, I have here the full resolution um, 20 micron data. And you see here uh, actually some large neurons. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, these these uh, can be giant bit cells because we are here um, in the motor region. Um, but I'm not a, a neuroscientist. I have to say I'm a computer scientist, so forgive me if there's something wrong. Um, what you can do here in the viewer is um, if you hit shift and then you click with the mouse in one of these orthogonal views and uh, uh, and drag. Then the system actually gives you uh, uh, access to, uh, allows you to rotate the data set and see oblique sections in the brain. Yeah? So I can use this here um, to, to actually get, uh, uh, for example, here in the cortex uh, to select um, a nice orthogonal view of the, of the layers here in the cortex, where you see better the layer structure. And you see nicely how, how this, how this uh, layer with the large modern neurons here um, extends in 3D. So these are things you can do and um, explore the big brain this way. Uh, one thing that I would like to point you to, it's we have a very new functionality, which is actually not uh, uh, yet very streamlined, but it's working. And that is a, a, um, that is a plugin for annotating uh, the, uh, these 2D views here. So you can select here on the top right this little um, icon here. You, you have access to plugins and there's an annotation mode. And when I select this annotation mode here, uh, there, is, uh, there are points, lines, and polygons. And I can actually here uh, um, very easily 
just by clicking annotate a structure. I can even annotate in oblique sections, of course, uh, and across sections, uh, but it's still just 2D polygons that we are doing here. Yeah, so uh, we, this is not this is not a 3D annotation. It's a 2D annotation in a, uh, in the 3D space here. But nevertheless, it's very useful um, to actually um, mark certain regions. And when you click here on the on this uh, button on the top left in annotation mode, you see your annotation. I just did a, an unnamed uh, polygon here, and I can I can give this a name. And I can click here around and, and go to the different vertices. And what's interesting is I can share this uh, polygon, and uh, it actually uh, is described in the metadata format that we are developing in the Human Brain Project, which is called Open Minds. And I can simply here um, copy this to the clipboard and reuse it or download this description of the of the um, annotation. Um, while Nicola was showing all these things, uh, you have seen it on my slides, I actually was playing around and I saw this very nice structure here, uh, which really looks like a mouse. Uh, it's uh, to me, uh, as I showed it to Susanna and she said it looks like a dog. But uh, however, um, if you like, just see if you can find it. Yeah, uh, Just browse around the big brain and see if you can quickly find it. I, I can give you a hint that this is not a very small structure, it's rather large, so you don't have to zoom in a lot. You can, you can find it when you're uh, zoomed out, but maybe uh, some of you are quick and find it. Um, I'm not, we're not spending 10 minutes on this. I just, you can just try this out while I'm talking and see if you can find the mouse or the dog. Maybe there's even an, uh, there's even an analogy uh, that the neuron is to misuse for this structure, I'm not sure. So you can see if you find it. And if you are able to quickly annotate it here in the annotation mode, um, you could even uh, paste the, uh, the annotate, copy the annotation and paste it in the chat. If not everybody's doing it because these annotations are quite long, because I could later on try it out to see if you, if you have found the same thing that I found. So while you're looking at this, of course, um, we can, if you are, um, change away, you can you can disable the cortical layers, and and look at um, look at cytoarchitectonic maps, and we can uh, of course switch to the MNI space, as I as I explained earlier. And now that I switched, you might have realized that the system um, preserves roughly the field of view. So I switched to the MNI space, and I'm now, now zoomed in. And I'm also in an oblique view. And this is because um, we are in the background using spatial transformations to preserve, um, to preserve roughly um, the position. So if I here, for example, select the, um, the primary visual cortex, I get a side panel where I can access these linked features that I was talking about. That's not the topic today. We can zoom in and uh, to the, uh, oops the visual cortex and if I then switch back to the big brain of course it doesn't make much much sense to zoom in so far at the millimeter scale but if I now switch back to the big brain model um, we should also approximately see here area one in the occipital hole and that's that's the case here quickly checking the, uh, the chat if somebody found the animal <laughs> Jordan John was writing something for the millimeter axial. That is maybe not far away. Um, so let's just, if I go back to annotation mode, I have actually stored it. Uh, so let me let me show you where it, where it is. So here, exactly the axial view. And uh, Jordan said something about 14. Yeah, minus 14. Here we are. And here you see the, the face. All right. Um, I didn't want to go so much in the, in the viewer. So one thing that I wanted to show you is the Python client. 
And the Python client is in development. So this is a package that can do a lot already, but it's in development. It's not yet stable and not everything is fully tested, but much is tested. And the link you see that here, I can uh, I can paste it in the in the chat, but it, of course you've always you also find that easily later on. Uh, but just Googling, it's called Zebra Python. And um, I will be showing you a notebook that you can run in parallel and access in parallel. So I have created a um, So there are also Py, Py packages, but they are sometimes a bit behind the latest version. There is a read the docs, of course, documentation. You find all that linked from the GitHub page. But uh, there is also on github.com, if you use my name, Dickscheid, uh, there is a Zebra Tutorials repository. You see that here, and I will paste that in with some um, examples that I'm continuously maintaining they typically refer to the latest development version. So if you try that out and you have problems, just let me know. Yeah, I'm updating this quite regularly with our development team. Um, so the link here, and I just realized I sent the other one only to Jordan, so here's the other link. So uh, the Zebra tutorial notebook, you see here a few, a few example notebooks, and I did one for the Big Bang workshop here. Um, which we will go through quickly that you can here uh, um, really access. And actually here on the bottom, uh, you see, you can hit this launch binder button and it will open this notebook uh, on my binder so you can run it there. Um, I will do that here on my local machine, but I think um, I, I launched it maybe an hour ago. So maybe this works quite quickly. And if you like, you can open it in your browser and run the commands in parallel. Just try it out. Just hit the launch binder button here on the button. And uh, hopefully you are lucky and you can access it quite quickly and run things in parallel. I will do this here on my local um, machine. So one thing that I wanted to show you um, First is, the, the library is called Zebra. I just import Zebra. And I can simply paste in here the JSON files, the JSON strings of these landmark annotations. So I did that here, yeah? I just copied and pasted the annotation of, uh, uh, of this animal face uh, that I just did. And I just, I just paste them in here as, as a string. And then I can tell Zebra that it should generate a structure from this specification. You know, I can do that and you see it has generated a point set and it knows that it's in the big brain space because the big brain space is actually listed in the, in the specification. So it, <clears throat> it knows it. And then what I can then do is quite easily um, create a bounding box of this structure. So of, of this, of this uh, point set of this polygon and access the big brain data around this structure. So if you look at this here, actually from these annotations, I could get points or point sets. This is why I make a distinction, but here we just have a point set. Um, and what I can do now is um, from this polygon structure, I can access the reference space, which is the big brain. And this is a semantic object in, uh, in Zebra. And I can ask the, um, the big brain object uh, to give me the actual template, which is the, which is the big brain image, which is a huge one, as you know. And what I can then do is I can fetch from the big brain template a certain volume of interest by just using the bounding box of that polygon. And I can request a certain resolution. Um, if I specify minus one, it will actually retrieve the largest resolution that it considers feasible according to a certain threshold and this threshold i think it's preset to some hundred megabytes but it can also be changed so if i um if i run this code i i can um and i can then simply plot the resulting image data with standard uh, tools from here here i use the plotting library from nylearn so that's nothing specific that is a very uh, common library and, the, and I get the big brain data right away compatible for nylon. I can plot it and I can also show the markers here for my polygon. And here you see the mouse again. Yeah, so you see that there's a 
a way of easily accessing the big train data and easily uh, going from the viewer from the annotations into the Python world. Um, how we access such big brain data, I will show that now in a bit more detail. And now we are coming to the other notebook, um, which is a bit more um, comprehensive. I hope you can read this. I will increase a bit the font size here. So I'm doing the same things here. I import Zebra and these uh, very useful packages from MyLearn. Um, that's, that's it. And then I can ask Zebra to give me the human brain, access to the human brain atlas, which is also just a semantic object. There's no data yet. This is just a semantic object with all the definitions. Um, and I can then do things like this. I can ask the atlas to give me the big brain template and to actually fetch the image data from the big brain template. If I don't specify here a volume of interest or resolution, it will fetch it at a lower resolution. Yeah? But I have then a lower resolution representation of big brain easily accessible here in Python as a spatial image object. And um, I can also ask the Atlas to give me maps in the big brain space. And per default, these are the cytoarchitectonic maps. And I also can fetch the image data of these maps to get these cytoarchitectonic maps. And I can just plot this um, on top of each other. And so you see here the currently mapped regions in the big brain. Uh, of course, at a lower resolution. Yeah. Um, we can use the very same logic uh, to access maps in the MNI 152 space. And I can also specify a, a map type. If I, um, if I request continuous maps, I will actually get the probability maps that you have seen. And, I, and these are 300. So when I now fetch image data, I have to specify one of these 300. And I take the number 94 and can plot this again. And you see here, I have a probabilistic map of a certain brain region. Um, one of the strengths of this library is that it connects semantic objects with image data. So when I see this 94th channel probability map here, um, you might wonder, well, what is the brain region? And uh, Zebra can easily uh, disambiguate this. So you can simply say, decode the map index 94. And it tells us this is area A to C44 on the left hemisphere. And this looks very reasonable. And what I get here, this result, that's actually an, a real object. It's not, it's not a name. That's, that's really a, an object with rich information. It has links to the probability maps, to the knowledge graph, and everything. But let's move on a little bit. You're certainly here in this workshop more interested. How do I get access to the higher resolutions in the big brain? So let's have a look at this. Um, what I'm doing here is actually, I look at a region, HOC5, uh, on the left hemisphere, which is not mapped yet in the big brain space. But of course, we have a probabilistic map in the MNI space. And what I can do here is I can um, search for this region. This is just a semantic object again, just, just like this one here, the representation of uh, HOC5 in the left hemisphere. But then I can ask the system to give me the bounding box in big brain space. Uh, of this region and to threshold the probabilistic map uh, at 80 percent so make it rather small this gives me a, a region of interest yeah region of interest object and um can also run this if, if you look at this region of interest object um there's a bounding box um and it's it has a reference to the big brain space so it, it is really attached to a reference space and it shows me here the the, the corner coordinates in big brain space where this region of interest is. Um, and now I can use this region of interest, which should approximately be, uh, be around HOC5 and big brain. Of course, not exactly, because we have just warped it from the MNI space to the big brain space. Um, but um, I can now again access the big brain template, um, adjust this feasible download size, and then I can fetch image data from the big brain template by using this volume of interest and asking to give me the highest possible resolution. Yeah? So when I run this, of course, I did pre-run it. It might be a bit slower if you do it. Then I get a chunk from the big brain at the full resolution only for this region. And I can use the same logic to fetch a chunk 
uh, from Conrad Wachstuhl's cortical layer segmentation. Yeah, just by saying Atlas, please give me the layer parcellation, the big brain space, and fetch the map uh, of this layer parcellation for the same volume of interest and also the highest possible resolution, um, as long as it's not getting too large. Um, and then I get spatial image objects as before, which I can plot with the standard tools, again, here using Nylon. You see here, I have now a high resolution chunk of big brain data, which should be uh, in, in, uh, in the, uh, at least the proximity, hopefully uh, uh, quite nicely in, in, in area A to C5, of course, according to the coordinate transformations that we have. And you see here also the cortical layer maps, which had been retrieved. Um, the nice thing is that these are all real spatial objects. So um, they are defined in physical space. And I can plot this high resolution chunk here on top of a lower resolution version of the whole big brain very easily to see where it is. So I can also um, fetch from the big brain the whole uh, brain by not specifying a volume of interest. Um, but then it will, of course, not return the, the full resolution because that would be very huge. It will return a lower resolution. Um, and then I can use standard plotting tools again here from Nylearn um, to plot these. The labels are, are, the, um, are these layer maps that I have here, the chunk of the cortical layers, and plot them on top of the big brain template. Yeah? I have done this here, and you see that actually they sit where they should. Yeah? So they have, they have all the spatial information attached and they can see here exactly where it belongs. Although I'm showing it here on a lower resolution version of the big brain. And they can of course do this not only with the labels, I can also plot the, uh, this, this chunk, that, uh, this image chunk that we had retrieved at the full resolution. So if I just put in here this chunk image, I think we call it image, image, yes. I can also put in this image here, of course, um, set the color map to gray, do the same thing. This might take a little longer. And then when I zoom in here, you see how this high resolution chunk sits here on top of the lower resolution whole plane model. Yeah, so it's quite easy to work here with high resolution um, volume of interest and quite safe because the library keeps track of all these semantics of the spatial metadata of the coordinate systems, the resolutions uh, um, for you. Now, before we, oh, we still have 10 minutes. Um, so, you, of course, we can use this to do other things um, in the big brain space. Um, one possibility is instead of um, instead of warping a volume of interest, a larger volume of interest uh, from MNI to big brain, what I could do is I could extract peaks from the probability maps in MNI space. This is also easily supported in Zebra, so I can just uh, ask for region. Here we one left hemisphere, and I can ask Zebra to find peaks of the probability map in the MNI space. <coughs> Sorry. And then I get I get the probability map and those peaks and can again very easily plot this. So I see here these peaks in the in the left hemisphere in the occipital lobe. And what I can then do, I can warp these um, these peaks. And I'm, I'm just taking the second one here from of the three, the third one, sorry. I can warp it to big brain space with a single command. Um, and I can then um, get the enclosing cube of three millimeter size at that position and retrieve again the chunk uh, at full resolution from the big brain uh, um, template of this three millimeter cube. Yeah, when, I, when I run this, it, it's very similar, but I have even smaller data sets and it was even easier to get this. So you see here, we, oops, a bit, a bit quick with this. When I zoom in, you see here this little chunk sitting in the in the big brain space at the right position um, at 20 micron resolution. And what I can then do, for example, um, I could generate very easily generate 
uh, cray value statistics in the different cortical layers according to the uh, the maps uh, from Konrad Wachstuhl. Just by doing the same thing that we've seen previously, I can get the cortical layer maps and fetch uh, the map at the full resolution for this new volume of interest that I've just specified here around around the peak from the probability map. Um, I can I can display this on top of each other so you see that here. And then of course it is it is uh, quite easy um, to 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 compute a histogram of the gray values in the different layers. Yeah, so what I'm doing here is this is just a spatial image object, the, the chunk that I here uh, extracted. I um, take access to the underlying data array. So we are now in voxel space, not anymore in the physical space as above. Then I do the same thing um, for the cortical layers, but I resample them to the same voxel space since usually we have different uh, um, different voxel spaces. So I resample the cortical layers here. This is also a function uh, from the Nylearn image module. I resample it to this chunk and also uh, get access to the voxel data. Then I have corresponding uh, volumetric arrays of the image uh, of the big brain gray values and these cortical layer maps. And then of course, it, it's, it's rather easy um, here to go across these different labels in the cortical layer masks, the different layers, and basically just with this is this call here, um, just access from the array of big brain intensities, the ones that are in this particular layer, uh, and ignoring the ones with full white color. This, this would not be necessary here. But the big brain has uh, the, the, with the value 255 in the in the big brain typically means background. So I'm also excluding the voxels that have an exact value of 255. And I just uh, store these layer-wise histograms. So I, I can I can run this again. This is not uh, this doesn't take very long because the chunk is not very large. And then I can I can plot uh, these histograms. And you can see here the uh, how the the different gray values um, appear in different uh, relative fractions in the different cortical layers. I didn't go deep into this, so I'm I don't know whether this is uh, correct and how much this corresponds to the real cell densities. Uh, this is of course a different question, and 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 we are studying this in some parts. So if um, if you do such things, it would of course make a lot of sense to sample. At, at, at different positions, at, at multiple positions, because if we go uh, further above, uh, just to um, recap a little bit, we have sampled here a single point in MNI space where we know there's a very high probability at this point that we are in the visual cortex, in the primary visual cortex in the left hemisphere, but then we warped this point to the big brain, and of course, this warping step uh, is not uh, error-free. Yeah, so there could be registration errors because we are going across modalities and across scales, um, and the the spatial transformations that we're using here have been computed in uh, in the in Paris in the uh, in the lab of Jean-François Magin um, using using their uh, their methods, um, which employs. Um, Salka constraints to drive the cross subject alignment. You could, of course, also do this with the big brain warp um, framework that, that, that Casey Pacola has developed and that is also presented in the, in, the, in the workshop. And you would probably get a slightly different point in the target space. So, what I want to say is that this warping of the point is, of course, not error free. You cannot rely that you are exactly in uh, in the right um, area. You could, uh, in the worst case, jump to a close across a, a sulcus and and end up in a close by, in a different region, very close by. So there could be errors when you when you do this. Um, and this should, if you sample this way, you should do it with many different samples and and do some additional proof checking. Of course, the idea was here just to give you an idea how uh, you can program with big brain and with brain regions to get access to big brain data. All right, and um, 
if, if I'm not mistaken, um, Susanna, I, I should end around 10 past seven. So I will do that now so that we have still a bit uh, of time for questions. I'm checking the chat whether there were any. I don't see any questions. Ah, there's, oh, uh, Roberto and Katja, you, you are raising hands, I see. Just go ahead. It looks, looks really, really very nice. So uh, in our case, uh, kind of we come from the other side. You, know, you said that you are uh, more of a computer scientist going to neuroscience, where a neuroscientist trying to mimic <laughs> computer scientists. Um, but so the, the, the micro draw tool that we have been developing is mostly something that we uh, have developed out of need because we had this data that we had to analyze and some other data we wanted to analyze and, and the, the tools that were around were just not, you know, like it was drawing in Illustrator or something like that. Um, but uh, I was wondering whether like it wouldn't make more sense for us as neuroscientists just to wait for you guys until uh, you develop this tool so that it can work with, with the big brain, but also with some other brains? Uh, or, or do you, how, how do you see, um, do you think that these sort of tools could just be a, a replacement for MicroDraw? And then, you know, because in, in our case, I think that we, we could benefit from having a, a much larger community of uh, real computer scientists developing a tool that, that we can just kind of Try to do as best as we can, but it, but it's by no means uh, as, as sophisticated as what what you can do with with proper. Well, proper. I'm I'm not I'm not uh, so sure about this. So uh, first of all, thanks a lot. But uh, um, I think it is great if we meet in the middle. You know, computer scientists coming to neuroscience and the other way around, and that's why we sit here. Um, but. I mean, MicroDraw is a great tool. Yeah, for example, the annotation uh, um, capabilities that I've shown here—they are very basic. And uh, I think that MicroDraw is—they uh, are in, in no way uh, a replacement for MicroDraw. I, I would say, uh, uh, as of now, what I would be very interested in uh, um, is to bring such things together. Yeah. So I think MicroDraw is much stronger and more intuitive um, if if you want to annotate in a section. And uh, one thing that I would that would actually like to do is, um, especially uh, Nicola mentioned that that we are uh, we are planning to release more one micron data with the big brain, and of course um, I would like to make that findable through these workflows through these tools here. So if you are in a, in a coronal section, the system would uh, uh, that that's how I envision it, how I would like to to build it. That the system uh, lets you know that there is for this coronal plane that you're looking at there is a one micron version that you could access yeah and if you want to work in that one micron version it would be great to just go from there to micro draw yeah because that's what for the purpose for which you have built micro draw and it works great so i'm very much for interoperability and uh, i would be very sad if you would stop doing this great work uh, just by assuming that uh, that we do more professional things. I'm not, uh, that's, well, that's not the case in all aspects, uh, definitely not, yeah. yeah. I, okay. I'm very much for interoperability of the tools and, and, and for a broad range of tools, yeah. So what, what, what I would rather say is, let's maybe talk whether we can, uh, we, we can um, uh, use the same, the same uh, data formats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that we are, for the annotations, we are using this uh, Open Minds format, which has, uh, for, for us at least, some advantages. It, it makes all the links uh, to the to these atlases very explicit. Um, so I think it would make sense, a lot of sense, to work on these ends to make things either use the same formats or or build simple uh, translators between them, so that we could jump from tool to tool. And, and just take the data to the different tools. Since most of this data is online, it's usually not so difficult to jump to a different tool, which uh, which then operates on the same data. Yeah, yeah. And, and as you were mentioning, the, I think that NiLearn is a very good example because yes. it's it's very easy to use even when it's not MRI data, like with histology data. So that that can give some sort of a template how this modularity can look like. 
Absolutely. So, so we, we didn't even think about building here a, a fewer functionality in on the Python level because it's perfect what what uh, Nylon offers and, and simply by adopting a data type, it's you get it for free. Yeah? And this is exactly how how uh, how you can be happy about about tools working together. I, I was I was very glad to see that this is was so easy. Yeah, There's, I gained so much from Nylon just by following. Uh, the, uh, the the data structures where possible. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roberto.